well, what, what's going to happen then? Well, then you're the one who's wrong, right? That's why he says do that. He says make your good works, make your way of how you're living your life be what they're ashamed of because they're going to have all these evil thoughts about you and these bad thoughts and malicious thoughts and false narratives, but they're going to go, and then someone's going to go, why would you have that about him or her? Don't give them any reason to go, well, because they do this, because they didn't do that. You don't want that. You don't want that. You want to make sure that you have nothing they can say about you that you can control that is, right? They can make up lies, but you don't want to have them give them any fodder to make up falsehoods. Yes? First of all, Todd said, uh, Paul has always said, it's my way or the highway. <laughs> Is that because he could say that he got his words directly from the Lord? And if so, did the people know that Paul's words were coming directly from the Lord? Robin said, just love on them. And Tracy said, is verse 2, um, Second Thessalonians three thirteen similar to Galatians six nine. I think. Let me see. <laughs> You're asking me this. I don't know off the top of my head. Let me see. Six nine. Yes. Yes, it is. Very good, Tracy. Yes, I love the connection. Yes. 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 Galatians six nine is real parallel to what he's talking about in. Um, 2 Thessalonians 2.13, yes. It goes back to, I love that, that, that Gaither song that says, keep on casting your bread upon the water. Because, you know, he says, there, he says, there are people that are thinking that they're not receiving any of the blessings that they're casting out there. But he goes, you just keep casting. It's like the, it's like the, uh, the first Corinthians uh, chapter 3. He says, Paul says, you may plant and I may water, but God causes all things to grow. Does that mean you stop planting because nothing's growing? No. Does that mean you stop watering because something's not growing? No. Do your job. Do your job. We're part of a team. And God calls it the body of Christ, the head, the nose, the feet, the hand. We each have to do our role. Stay in your lane. Do what you're supposed to do. Do what you're supposed to do and stop being concerned with and worried about and using a justification what they're not doing or are doing to validate what you're not doing. That's where you don't want to find yourself. That's, what, that's the whole point of all this. Yeah. And Tracy said, uh, six nine is my favorite verse. Oh, yeah, that's and great. And I'll add this Thessalonians 1, 2. Yep. In other words, don't be discouraged. It's awesome, right? So you have a question? I'm sorry. Or stay, oh, sorry. Okay. No, that's okay. So in verse 15 of Second Thess Thess Thessalonians chapter 3, he said, and regard them, and that is the word to esteem them. It's the, it's the root word for the word lead out or, or how you lead in conversation about them, how you, how you speak about them. Do not speak about them or refer to them as an enemy. That's, that's, a, pretty, that's a serious charge against us because I'll, I'll just be honest. I'm going to be honest. When the people like that who put up false narratives and the veneer and they act like they're just like you when they're not, when they're hollowed out sepulchers and they want to act like they've attained what you've attained and you put forth the work and the effort and you're still struggling, you have your sins and they want to act like they're better than you, it gets irritating. And then you want to lash out and you want to refer to them as, you know, whatevers, right? And Paul's saying, God's telling Paul, don't, don't do that. Don't, don't do that. Don't refer to them as an enemy, but admonish them. Remember what admonish means? It means to to instruct them, to correct them through instruction. That's admonishment. Admonishment is not like, you're wrong, dummy. No, 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 no. Admonishment is, you, okay, you like I are both sinners, identify with the person, and as we are sinners, we need to grow in Christ. And as we have to struggle with our sins, I too struggle with certain things. It seems like what you're struggling with is, but but up. And that's how you, you identify with people. You don't condescend them, right? You identify with them. You admonish. You instruct them. <laughs> that's what admonish means. You correct them through instruction. And you don't correct through instruction by condescending somebody, by insulting them. You identify with them. You acknowledge, acknowledge, identify, and then you define. So you acknowledge who they, where they are at. You're a sinner like me. You're a sinner like me. I acknowledge, identified with them. I'm the same. And then you, then you describe what's going on. If they want to be a part of that conversation, our process, you'll, you'll know. You, they might not want to for many years or months, but it doesn't mean you don't, you don't stop trying when given the opportunity. You don't pursue opportunities. God gives them to you. Now in verse 16, Now may the Lord of peace, I love this, 
This phrasing, the Lord of peace, the first time I could see it being used was when Gideon was scared stiff and, and God told him uh, that he should have peace and Gideon called him the Lord of peace, which I think was really interesting when he was outnumbered and didn't think it was a God, the man that God could use. And because you had that phrasing, the God of peace, as we know, but the Lord of peace is different, like the authoritative existent one is the one of peace in your life. So God's authority, and he didn't say God of peace, which he does say in Philippians, right? In quite a different places in Romans, may the God of peace. But this is the Lord of peace. So the Lord of the peace is speaking to the authority God has in your life as the sovereign who has given you the insight to him and his word. May who he is and who he has how he has blessed you be that which gives you peace. Don't, don't let someone take from you who he is and what he's given you in your life and give you unrest. That doesn't make any sense, does it? So it isn't just the God of peace. It's his sovereign will in your life to love you specifically the way he has and the manner in which he has. Always give you peace in every way. The Lord be with you all. And then he says the salutation of Paul with my own hand as if it's referring to Timothy writing this for him as Paul's dictating to him and Timothy's writing it. So the salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is a sign in every epistle, thus I write. He says, the favor of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you. So I want to end with reminding ourselves that when he says the disorderly people among you, uh, again, talking about these people that are in um, verse 11, those that are walking out of order, I want you to remind you as we end up on this, on this chapter here, on this epistle, those walking out of order are mainly three people. The disobedient ones, which are the Brephos and Nepios of Sperma. Those who heard the word of the mysteries being sown, but it was the seed fallen by the road. They didn't care. They didn't even, it never took, never took any soil, never took root. Then there's immature ones. Those are the, the, the pation, I mean the, the micros person, excuse me, who hid the, the seed in the soil and didn't do anything with it because they were, they were just so over, overwhelmed by it. There's the Pation and, 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 and Technon who, who are immature. They're alive to it. They're growing, but they're just immature. They haven't produced the 30 fruit that Mark 4 talks about. Then there's the Niskos person, the lowest level, which is the Teleosis, the lower maturity person, who is the foolish one that God talks about in Matthew 25. The one who knows what right is and doesn't do it. That's what foolish means. Moron, we call it. That's the word, moros. It's the word for foolish. A person who knows what right is and doesn't do it. These are the ones acting out of order at the level that Paul has taught them, at the information he has given them, and the level of what he's told them what's out ahead and what's at stake, and what the, what the rewards are, the highest level of being with Christ and intimacy, the judgment out ahead, the tribulation out ahead, everything they know. And he says, if you can act like a disobedient one, an immature one, or a foolish one, that's out of place. How could you possibly tell me that that's in alignment with what I just told you? That makes no sense. So I asked somebody at, at work, and I'll, uh, I just last, I tell you the last statement I'll make about this is, I said somebody at work not to freak them out. They weren't a person. He, believed in, he believes in Christ, but he wasn't somebody who's avidly you know, engaged in things. But I said, hey, if, if, if I were to say to you, I'm not saying I'm saying this, but if I were to say to you that you knew the world was going to be ultimately different and your life would be forever changed in the next, say, three years, just saying, what would you change differently? And he goes, I wouldn't be working here. <laughs> I said, okay, but what does that mean exactly? He said, I would, I'd be, I'd be, uh, I'd be doing a lot of things different seeking God in my life. I go, well, you should consider that, what you just said. I'm just, he goes, what do you, what do you know? I don't know. I said, I, I don't know anything. I don't, no one knows the actual date of that stuff. But let's just say, if that were to happen in the next three years, don't be surprised. That's all I'm saying. I'm not saying it's going to happen. I'm not saying that. I'm just saying it wouldn't surprise me if it did. And so it would be unbecoming if you know that and you live frivolously. It would be unbecoming of you if it's a possibility, which it is, I'm not saying it's going to happen, but it's a possibility. And if you get live frivolously and live less seriously and live less engaging in God in your life and less involved in your faith, how does that make sense? That's unbecoming. That's, that, that's out of order. Why would you step away from it, disobedient? Why would you act flippant to it, immature? And why would you act foolish to it, which is to go half-hearted at it? Why, why would you do that? And those are the things that Paul's talking about. Because, by the way, if they exist now, they existed then and vice versa. They existed then. That's why they exist now. So we're in good company. Nothing out of the ordinary. Solomon said it. There's nothing new under the sun. We're all humans. We all <laughs> don't lie to ourselves. Like, oh, we got it all under wrap. No, we all struggle with this stuff. But he's warning us to check ourselves. Don't vet everybody else. Vet yourself. 
Vet yourself. Just kind of ask God. And I ask God, yeah, don't, I don't want to be disobedient. I don't want to be immature. I don't want to be foolish. Those are the three things I do not want to be when it comes to the fact of what he's given me and what I'm in charge with. Because I, I, without me having the right premise of that, I, I can't, and nothing else is going to be right. I can't love the right way. I can't, I can't be you know, in, in the right kind of relationship if I'm being disobedient, immature, and foolish. That makes no sense with any person, God or, or man. Yes? Todd said, um, Paul has always said it's my way or the highway. Yeah, you said that before, yeah. Did I read that before? Yeah, you did, you did, yep. Okay, he didn't think that I did, but... Uh, yeah, so when he says my way or the highway, I did, probably didn't answer it. So not, he probably was, want you to repeat it to me. So when Paul's saying that, to your point, you're right. He's saying those terminologies not in the way of my way or the highway, but in saying it's God's word, not my word. It's it's not, he's not saying my way or the highway. That's your, I know, I know what you mean by that. But what he's saying by that is, when he was saying that before about my gospel and things, he was referring to the fact that they were questioning his apostleship. Now again, we talked about the last thing I was going to say, but now I got one more thing I add on here. Is that, just, you got to remember, you can't, no one can compare yourself to Paul. Paul and, and Job, for example, are two unique figures in the entire scripture. They both have a very unique, the person of covenant, and a person in testament of Job and Paul. They both have extremely unique situations that will never, ever be duplicated. Ever. Okay? I'm going to sure we're clear on this. Ever even come close to being duplicated. Job, 10 children dead in one day. Then, everything he owns, gone in the second day. His health, gone. His wife says, you can't, I can't deal with this. Deal with it on your own. And then God turns a silent deaf ear to him for over five months. Then you're going to tell me that anybody else has experienced that. You're lying. No one else has ever, ever, and will never experience that. Never. He was a type of Christ. Then you have Paul. Paul murders women, children, men. Is proud about it. Does it for two years. And talks about how he's going, yeah, they were worshiping the false god as far as I was concerned. So I was taking them out. Okay. Not cool, man. But he was doing that, and then Christ knocks him on his butt, literally, literally off the horse on his butt, which is kind of ironically funny, and saying, get on your butt. And he sees Christ, and who are you? I'm the one you persecute. Wait, what? Yeah, you were wrong. And he's like, oh. then he gets blind, and he can't see. Scales in his eyes. And then an eye has come, makes him see, and everything else is history. He grows in like a week from like a zero to this big hero in the faith. Everybody's like, and then remember, his first time meeting the apostles in Acts 9 and 10, and Barnabas is right there. They go, uh, too soon. Now, he just killed so-and-so's wife and mother and their kids and then murdered their father. I'm going to go with too soon just to say, oh, we love you. It's okay. No, we love you, but we, get, we need some time here. You just cause collateral damage to the extent of a deep emotional scar. Now, I'm not saying we don't love you. Would you stop with the whole, Jesus said, I know he said to forgive. Would you stop it? We're still humans. We need space and time. Chill out. Okay? He's got to go. go. Go to Tarsus. So he goes to Tarsus. Then God talks, it goes out, and then God talks to him on the backside of the desert in Arabia for three years. And then Barnabas says, come with. And then after that, then he starts to become a focal point of Christianity at the Jerusalem Council. He has a little bit of a pff, little word to say. And after that, it turns on to a focal point on Apostle Paul. And then in Corinth, was earmarked by people who constantly used what I just mentioned against him. They constantly said, oh, the murderer's back. Oh, the, the one who slayed women and children's back, the proud, arrogant ass is back in town. Oh, yeah. They were making fun of him all day long. Not I say ass, I mean like as a donkey, as, a, as in a stubborn mule. That's how he was. He was stubborn and thought, no one else is right but me. No one else sees the truth but me. That's what he thought. That's how he was acting. And then, but he was a different man. He was changing. God was changing him. But all his life, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, it, Paul says, I want the thorn taken from me. And, Paul, and God said, no. Where you're weak, I'm strong. And what was the thorn? Going back to Numbers, the thorn is the people who were constantly cutting this like that from underneath him, insulting him, berating him, condescending him, emasculating him. God said, you need to live with that. What do you mean live with that? In like you didn't... You, <laughs> wait, wait a minute. For two years, you took lives. People are living with that, aren't they? The least you can do is live with their insults. Stop it with your asking me about the thorn. See yourself how they see you. You took their loved ones out of their very life. 
So when Paul later on would say, it's my word of the highway, he doesn't mean me. He means this is not me talking anymore. This is my God talking in and through me. So it's God's word. This is my gospel, meaning God loved me and forgave me. This is his truth he wants you to know. And that's why he says it that way. Is it to emphatically separate the man he was to the man he is. That's why his name was changed from Paul, or to Saul, from Saul to Paul. And that's why the Jews knew him as Saul always, but the G Gentile people, the people in Christ, knew him as Paul. That was a small pebble. That's the reason why he says, my way, how, if you will. He doesn't mean me. He means what God's given to me. It's what God's given to me and no, no other way. He understood that now. Before it's what he took from God, but now it's what God gave him. And it's two different things. He understood. Don't take from God and use it for your own nefarious purposes that you think were right but were wrong all along. That's a bad place to be. And that's what he found out the hard way. And he had the, people he, he left in collateral damage in his wake had to live with the brokenness of their hearts and their families fractured forever because he killed their loved ones. And he can't deal with their condescension and their emasculation and their insults and their hatred and their malice, even though they believe in Jesus. Like, are they wrong? Sure they're wrong. Yes, they're wrong. That's what Paul even said in 2 Corinthians chapter 13. He says, check yourself. Even if I am the evil wretch that you say I am, how is God pleased with you acting this way about me, being all this malicious bitterness? I, I, you're justified. I get it. But it's wrong. It's wrong. Not when you're in Christ, you can't do that. No, no, no. So he was telling Paul, it works both ways. They're wrong what they're doing, but so are you asking me to take away a thorn. Why would I take away your consequence when theirs isn't taken away? Theirs lives on forever. They always have to cry for their loved ones that you killed. They're always going to remember their daughter being slain in front of their eyes. Remember their house being burned down as you were happy about doing it. They're not going to forget that image in their head, ever. Why should I take the thorn from your flesh? Why? Tell me why. Why should I do that when they live in their pain and anguish? Why? That goes back to what we talked about before about, about forgiveness and, and restitu restitution reconciliation. You have to own what you've done to people and done unto people and make right by them. So when Paul says my gospel, he doesn't mean about me. He means the gospel that God gave me in contrast to the new man he's become and becoming before he was the man that took from God and applied it the way he thought was right. He got that all wrong. He knows that for a fact. And he lives with the consequence of it for the rest of his life. Which is why he told Timothy, remember the last book he wrote, about a year before he dies, the Lord saves sinners of whom I'm chief. <laughs> you think he didn't get over that? No. He never got over the fact that he was a pathetic human being who took human life. He can't give it back. You can't do that. They're gone. He did that. He has to live with that. It sucks. But he didn't let it, you know, he let it not ever leave his mind, but didn't let it paralyze him to walk with God in love and forgiveness. But he was just always eternally grateful for his, his forgiveness. Yeah. Todd said, did the people know that Paul's words were coming directly from the Lord? Yes, because he would always start off his letters, uh, Paul, a called apostle of Jesus Christ. Yes. That's why he always starts off that way. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ. He always, call, he always calls himself that to make, yes. That's why he does that, to make it clear. I'm not saying this on my account. This is on what God told me to say. I'm, I'm under strict dictatorship, if you will. I'm a slave to the truth. That's what he was saying. So anyway, I hope that answers your question. I, we had a little lengthier study than usual. I apologize for the length. We'll close in prayer. So Father, thank you for this time we've had again today. Thank you for your love, your forgiveness, your restoration, your encouragement, your, re your just refreshing spirit in our life. Thank you for reminding us continuously about the gratitude we have for what you've given, continuing to show us who you are in many manifold ways, the depth of your scripture and how deep it really goes. But then with all of that, to help us be infused in our lives, how to think and act and live differently and strengthen our relationship with you so we can be better in our relationships with others and help us to be uh, people that have good behaviors and good habits and good works externally out of us so that they can say nothing bad about us. Let us work not on those who are naysayers or those who are pretenders of, of righteousness, spewing falsehoods, but let us rather focus on what you expect from us, our responsibilities, our obligations, our accountabilities, just being better. There's always room, always, for us to improve in our walk with you and with others. Let the outside noise not influence in us and where our, where our true focus should be in our walk with you, pleasing to you, exemplifying you, so they can see more of you in us. And we end with the thoughts of John the Baptist, that you would increase and that we would be decreased in our life. We ask this in Jesus, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Yes. And Todd said, interesting, that makes sense, the introductory in his letters. Yeah, that's why he always says that. 
I thought that was not too long. I know it's a little lengthier than usual. Do you like that? I mean, I don't know. <laughs> is, that too, is that too much information? <laughs> no, it was awesome. Um, actually, I don't think I've ever gotten that.